Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to be talking about a very monumental and a very important event that happened in the history of our planet that transformed it into what it is today. The event known as the Great Oxygenation Event. But more specifically we're talking about some of the recent discoveries that suggest that the event wasn't just a one-time thing. It was something that was happening on our planet for a very very long time going back and forth in between low oxygen and high oxygen levels. And specifically, the discovery also implies that approximately 2.2 billion years ago, the oxygen on our planet almost completely disappeared. Which suggests that back then, our planet could have taken any one of the two paths. The path of having oxygen and a lot of it, or the path of having absolutely no oxygen on the surface. Which means that once again, it seems that planet Earth got really really lucky. But let's talk a little bit more about this, starting with the idea of early Earth. With the surface probably resembling something like this, and being a more or less very hot world devoid of any possible life on the surface, with a lot of volcanic activity, a lot of dangerous emissions, and huge and huge amounts of various gases. But definitely no oxygen. Or at least almost no oxygen. There could have been some oxygen present, but it would really not be enough. And then for the next few billion years, Earth started to transform quite dramatically. At first it was what NASA refers to as the pale orange dot, or essentially a barren planet with almost nothing on the surface. Then it most likely turned purple because of the new life that started forming on the planet. Then it became ice planet a few times and it transformed back and forth, back and forth. There's actually an older video on the channel where I go through the various faces of planet Earth and it should be popping up somewhere above my head at some point. But about 2 billion years after the creation of the planet, something unusual started to happen here. Today the scientists are not entirely certain what happened, but the assumption is that it was some sort of a battle between different types of bacteria. And more specifically between bacteria such as the archaea bacteria that often does not rely on oxygen and actually prefers to live in non-oxygen atmospheres, and various other types of organisms such as for example algae that tend to release oxygen as a byproduct of various processes. And this battle started to do something really unusual to the planet. It started to dramatically transform the atmosphere of the planet from one type to the other. And the thing is, some of these organisms could only survive on one type of the planet. For example, the oxygen barren Earth is great for the organisms we have on the planet today. But a lot of ancient bacteria has to hide from oxygen because it's actually toxic to it. Whereas the non-oxygen version of the planet is obviously great for a lot of these bacteria, but a lot of modern algae and a lot of modern organisms would really not be able to survive here. But at some point, Earth has gone from having almost no oxygen to having a lot of oxygen. And this was the so-called Great Oxygenation Event. In some sense, it can also be seen as the final triumph of algae and a lot of other organisms that usually produce oxygen and thus present an opportunity for other life on Earth to evolve. But in terms of how all of this happened and how the oxygen sort of increased on the planet, up until recently the scientists believed that this was an event that most likely started really slowly, then accelerated and then increased to the point where there was a lot of oxygen approximately 800 million years ago. In other words, it was always believed that this was a kind of an accumulation event. At some point, bacteria started to produce oxygen. It most likely caused the extinction of some of the other earlier bacteria that couldn't live in oxygen. And then, as the life evolved, more and more oxygen was released into the atmosphere. But a lot of recent discoveries kind of presented a problem for all of this. First of all, the scientists identified some of the photosynthetic genes that were already present in some of the earliest life on the planet. So it's very likely that photosynthesis was actually always there. And that means that oxygen was probably produced really really early on in the existence of life on the planet. But at the same time some of the other recent studies discovered that the oxygenation event was multi-stage. It actually happened several times over a few hundred million years. With the first minor oxygenation event occurring about 2.45 billion years ago, which first raised the levels of oxygen, but then the levels dropped back to the original values, with several other, even bigger events occurring about 100 million years after. But what's even more interesting is that each of these events was correlated with a major glaciation event on the surface of the planet. The events that we sometimes refer to as the Ice Bowl Earth, 
And that's basically when the entire planet undergoes a dramatic climatic change and the entire planet loses the ability to maintain heat and thus becomes frozen. Something that very likely happened for one major reason, the lack of so-called greenhouse gases on the surface. And so for about 200 million years right here, the levels of oxygen on the planet fluctuated quite dramatically, while also changing the surface of the planet, going between being an ice world covered in ice almost entirely, back to the original surface that it had before based on the amount of oxygen and the greenhouse gases present in the atmosphere. And then approximately 2.22 billion years ago, that's when the Earth officially acquired the highest levels of oxygen and maintained really high levels of oxygen ever since. Something that becomes quite obvious if we look at any of the rocks, such as this one right here that's about 2.1 billion years old, that allow us to see the iron formation that was created in a high oxygen environment. And it's actually because of the deposits in other rocks that the scientists were able to discover all of this. And specifically, they look at the presence of different types of sulfur isotopes that are usually present in rocks that have been produced in oxygen-free environment. So for example, you would not be able to find these sulfur isotopes in this rock, but you would be able to find it in some of the other ancient rocks that were made on Earth when there was almost no oxygen. And so by choosing several younger rocks from various regions in South Africa, they were able to create this timeline that you see right here with four different oxygenation events that correlated with various glaciation events. And so during this time, the oxygen levels were extremely unstable and went up and down all the time. But what exactly caused these fluctuations? What's the actual chemical reaction here? Well, it's probably due to the fluctuations of methane. A greenhouse gas that's extremely efficient at trapping heat on the planet, it's actually even more powerful as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide, but methane tends to actually disappear or get destroyed by the presence of oxygen in the atmosphere. To be more specific, it takes about 12 years for the methane molecule to disappear and to turn into something else. And that's actually why methane today doesn't play as big of a role as a carbon dioxide molecule. Carbon dioxide can persist in the atmosphere for an extremely long time. And so on this early Earth, when there was no oxygen, methane could easily persist for a pretty long time as well and thus heat up the planet much easier. And remember back then the sun wasn't actually producing as much light and it was also much cooler in that sense. So it was much easier for Earth to suddenly become an ice world like this one right here. But if suddenly a lot of cyanobacteria or some other organism starts to produce a lot of oxygen on the planet, this oxygen will then start to decrease the amount of methane in the atmosphere. Even if the bacteria releases CO2, it's just not going to be enough to warm up the planet, mostly because methane is just much more potent as the greenhouse gas. And with the amounts of methane dropping suddenly, the Earth starts to freeze and becomes an ice bowl pretty quickly. Ironically though, by turning the world into a nice world, the cyanobacteria would very likely start disappearing as well, with some species possibly even becoming extinct. And so then the Earth would stay as an ice bowl for quite some time, until some sort of a major eruption or some other major event such as maybe an asteroid collision would melt all of this ice, turning the Earth into a water world once again. Although it's also possible that the planet could have been warmed up by the sudden increase in the volcanic activity. And so for one reason or another, the Earth warms up, melts all of the ice, uncovers all of the oceans and restarts the cycle once again, because the cyanobacteria once again starts pumping all of this oxygen into the atmosphere, most likely destroys a lot of methane released by the volcanoes and a lot of other stuff, and again turns the Earth into an ice bowl. But all of this was actually really surprising because first of all, after the third such glaciation event, the scientists discovered that the levels of oxygen were actually extremely low. And the final drop was of course also correlated with the glaciation event that most likely made a lot of this early cyanobacteria go extinct once again. At the same time, all of these swings between the ice bowl earth and normal earth was actually really important for another reason. A lot of the early carbon dioxide that was released by the cyanobacteria ended up creating a lot of carbonic acid and saturating the oceans, which allowed the oceans to become more acidic and also dramatically increased the amount of rocks that were suddenly dissolved and released a lot of nutrients into the oceans. Because this cycle happened several times, it most likely saturated the early oceans with a tremendous amount of nutrients 
necessary for early life to develop even more. And so here we had early Earth with a lot of volcanic activity and a lot of nutrients released from the volcanoes, while at the same time the acidic oceans were stripping rocks of important things like phosphorus, something that was slowly saturating the planet with a lot of nutrients for this early life. And at some point it reached a level where the life had enough stuff around to continuously evolve and to continuously change the atmosphere into the oxygen atmosphere we have today. And all of this most likely lasted for several hundred million years and finally finished about 2.2 billion years ago. This was essentially the end of this oxygenation event, but it wasn't a single event like we thought before. It was more a continuation with a lot of swings back and forth with each event releasing more and more nutrients into the oceans of planet Earth. Something that was very likely absolutely essential for further life to develop and for further life to evolve later on. And so what all of this shows is that the history of Earth was a lot more complicated than we initially thought. And at the same time it also shows us that these events are very dynamic, they also can go either way, and a lot of these events are really important for the development of a lot of conditions necessary for life to evolve. So all of this was absolutely crucial for Earth to become the way it is today. The nutrients, the amount of oxygen, all of this came from these early battles between the bacteria, the cyanobacteria, and a lot of other early organisms that changed and transformed the planet several times. And so by understanding this a little bit better and by knowing the history of our own planet, we might be able to discover some other planets out there that are going through this right now as well. But for now that's kind of all we learned. It's a pretty exciting discovery, but we still don't really know everything about the history of the planet. Once we learn more, I'll make sure to follow this up with another video. Until then, thank you for watching, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else, and maybe support this channel Patreon by joining the channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. I'll see you tomorrow, stay wonderful, and as always, bye bye.